Thanks for joining us for this weekly webinar on Arachnids of Texas. My name is Molly Keck and I am an Integrated Pest Management Program Specialist and also a Board Certified Entomologist. We're going to be looking into some of the more common arachnids that are not spiders that you might be concerned or worried or just curious about that you might find in your own backyard. So just to give you a little bit of a reminder of where arachnids fall in the grand scheme of things, remember that the way that we classify living things is by putting them into groups. And so a domain is the largest group that things can fall underneath. We and other animals are all in the domain eukarya, where eukaryotic organisms, meaning multicellular organisms. And then there's kingdoms, and kingdoms are also very broad categories. Animalia is the kingdom that arachnids are under. We are in the kingdom animalia as well. And the phylum arthropoda is what separates us as humans in the phylum chordates from arachnids and other insects which are in the phylum arthropoda. In arthropoda we have different classes, insects, crustaceans, millipedes, centipedes, and that's where arachnids fall in. So arachnids are arthropods, animals, and eukaryotes. So if you look a little bit further and go from class into order, we will find that there are many different orders of arachnids, and that's what we're gonna be looking into. So some characteristics that tell you an arthropod is an arthropod is that they have, now remember, insects, arachnids, crustaceans are all in the phylum arthropoda. And so in order to be an arthropod, you have an exoskeleton that covers the outside of your body, and you also have jointed appendages and segmented bodies. So these arachnids that you see here have those segmentation to the body, and also you can see the shed skin left behind from that tarantula. They have an exoskeleton that they must molt in order to grow and get larger. If you're an arachnid, you have some other characteristics. One is that they have two body regions, and these are often called the cephalothorax and the abdomen, or the prosoma and the epithosoma. They have eight legs, or four pairs of legs. They never have antenna, they never have wings, and oftentimes they have enlarged palps or pedipalps that will allow them to feel, um, to taste things might be used in courtship as well. You can see here that there are a huge number of orders and species and types, groups of different types of arachnids. They do not just encompass our spiders, they encompass all sorts of other very unique looking animals. So we're going to break it down further again into those orders. There are about 65,000 species of arachnids worldwide. There's a, only about 8,000 of those species in North America. And most scientists will agree that you can put arachnids into 11 major groups. But we're really going to only cover six of those 11 groups, and we're not going to go into much detail on species. We're just going to give you a broad overview of what those groups look like. Thankfully, they are fairly broad, so it's easy to know what one species is encompasses pretty much all the others. Those six major groups that we're going to be looking into are Acari, Scorpionis, Europigi, Pseudoscorpionis, Solifugi, and Opilionis. If you're interested in learning more about spiders, I would encourage you to check out the My Extension 210 YouTube channel, the channel that you're on right now, and check out the spider webinars that we have posted and library there. We're not gonna be covering spiders during this webinar because we're gonna be looking at all of the other types of arachnids, the ones that maybe you're not so much familiar with. The first order that we're gonna look into is the order Akari. These are all of the ticks and mites. This is a very, very diverse and broad group of arthropods. They rival insects in many ways um, as far as where they're found, how diverse that is, how diverse their habitat, their biology, and their food sources are. There's about 30,000 plus described ticks and mites, and some scientists argue that there are potentially half a million that are yet to be discovered. They range from being aquatic to terrestrial. They're parasitic, scavengers, and they're also plant feeders. In general, when you look at the order Akari, 
They have oval shaped bodies. They have a very reduced head region that's basically just the mouth parts and their life cycle is fairly unique. The adult lays eggs. The eggs hatch into what we call larvae that only have six legs, not the, not the eight legs to them. Then they will molt and become nymphs, and at the nymph stage, they're still not adults, but they have their four sets or four pairs of legs at this point, eight legs total, and then the adult stage, and they rotate through that throughout their life. There are many different species of ticks. We consider ticks to be in the suborder Ixodida, and there are different types of ticks. There are hard-bodied and there are soft-bodied ticks. There is an excellent resource at the tickapp.tamu.edu, tickapp.tamu.edu, where you can find information about different how to identify different types of ticks, what their distribution is, if they carry diseases, all, all the information that you could possibly want to know about ticks. Even their management is found on this website. So if you're interested in ticks, if you're curious if you find one, if it's dangerous, I would highly recommend that you check that website out and see if you can spot and identify it there. Probably the most common type of tick that you encounter is the brown dog tick. You can see it is totally cosmopolitan, found throughout the United States. Very common on your dogs and even on your cats. And so it's a very common one that we see in rural environments, but also in urban environments where you have pets and dogs hanging out and living outside. So I mentioned that ticks can be soft or they can be hard bodied. They are mainly feeders, blood feeders, of mammals, birds, and reptiles. So they are considered ectoparasites or parasites on the outside of an animal's body. And amazingly, this is the most important vector of disease to our domestic animals. They transmit so many diseases to them, including our livestock, that they're extremely important and many veterinary and medical entomologists study them. They're also the second most important vector to human diseases, only second to mosquitoes. So we hear a lot about mosquito control and managing mosquitoes and understanding that mosquitoes carry disease, but ticks are the second most important vector, and we often don't hear a lot of educational programs about them. Ticks will lay their eggs in various different spots, but they do not lay their eggs on the host. And then when those eggs hatch, they will uh, seek out trying to smell CO2 put out by the animals, and also vibrations as they're walking on the ground to be able to find their host. And a lot of ticks are three host ticks, meaning that throughout their life cycle, they will start on smaller hosts and then gradually grow to larger hosts. So a young um, nymph, when it hatches, might find its first host on some sort of a small rodent, like a mouse or a rat. Then after it has fed, it will drop off. It's full of blood. It will shed. And then it will now be an unfed nymph with its four legs. And it might find something a little bit larger, like a small, um, a rabbit or a fox or a dog or a cat, something, a medium sized animal. It becomes engorged. It will drop off. It will molt. And then as an adult, it may feed on something extremely large, like a, like a cow or maybe a large dog. It's very common for many of these species of ticks to have three separate hosts to them. And that also aids in their ability to vector various diseases. Ticks have an important part of our history in the United States. It was the 1600s when we started finding that our cattle were dying from this unexplained disease. And it took quite a long time before the USDA and the government was able to figure out what was causing cattle, fever, cattle tick fever. Finally, it was discovered through a series of scientists that it was, it was um, caused by a certain organism called Babesia, and that then eventually found it was transferred or transmitted, vectored by a, the southern cattle tick. And so a huge effort was made to um, force people to treat all of their cattle as they came across the border to try to reduce this because it's extremely detrimental to cattle. It attacks and destroys their red blood cells um, and it's a 90% death rate. So it's basically a death sentence. If your cattle get it, it spreads very rapidly from the ticks and oftentimes it's very hard to manage and get under control. And so there were huge efforts made to force the cattle to be dipped, to 
check cattle as they came across the border, and eventually we got the disease under control. However, in the state of Texas, where it's eradicated in other parts of the United States, we don't see that here in Texas as we transfer and move cattle across the border. It's still found in Mexico, and we still have hot spots in different bordering counties where we will see cattle tick fever spike, or we will have cases of cattle tick fever. So there are tick wranglers who will check those cattle, make sure that they don't have ticks on them, etc., to try to help manage it and keep it so that it doesn't get into other cattle populations beyond the border of Texas and Mexico. The Acariformes group is a group of Acari, the order Acari, which are which include the mites. And mites are very interesting because they're actually very diverse, but many of us when we hear the word mite, we think of something that will bite us and make us itchy. They can be predaceous, they can be plant feeders, and they can also be parasites. So the bottom left-hand picture are your scabies mites. This is what causes mange in your dogs and your cats, and we can actually get scabies as humans. Very itchy, um, usually forms, usually they're found in areas of the skin where the skin touches skin tightly. So it could be between the fingers, under the armpits, in the groin area, um, sometimes at the bottom of the feet but places where it's nice and tight and moist and skin touches skin. Easily transmittable or transferable between person to person through skin contact and also from dog to human and human to dog if you're petting um, a dog that has it. We also have some pl plant feeding mites like the two spotted spider mites or many of the other species of spider mites that you may or may not have heard about. These feed on plant cells, so we have plant feeding mites. The top two pictures are galls that uh, the, there's a, a gall is on the top right hand side, the gall mite, a type of or a species of gall mite, and then the galls that they form there as they're feeding. So there's various different, a great variety of different types of mites and different things that they do. But by and large, mites are extremely minute, very, very small, oftentimes microscopic. They're generally very specific to a host. So scabies is found on dogs, cats, mammals. There are mites that might be found only on birds, only on rodents, um, only on chickens, on many different things, um, but they're specific to their host. Yes, they might be able to bite you, but they really can't persist and reproduce off of you and off of your blood. Now we're all very well familiar with the order Scorpionis. Everybody pretty much knows what a scorpion is if you've lived in Texas long enough. They are a nocturnal arachnid. They have enlarged pedipalps that have been modified into pinchers. So in the front, you can see those kind of pinching organ, organs uh, that they use to capture their prey. The end of their abdomen terminates in a sting, and they can use that to sting us, which is extremely painful. They mainly feed on insects and other spiders during the evening hours. And what's kind of unique about them is that their young are born alive as opposed to being laid in eggs. So she gives birth to live young. And then those babies will hang out on the back of the mother for a period of time but until they are old enough to feed for themselves. They generally live very, very long lives. Scorpions can live up to two years before they reach maturity. So as far as arthropods go, this is a long life, especially compared to many insects that only live a couple months at the longest. The striped bark scorpion is by and large the most common species of scorpion that we have in Texas. It's the one that most people encounter. The males tend to have a longer tail than the females do. So if you can look at the proportion of the tail to the body, if it's about as long or longer than the body, then you're probably looking at a male. Females are more bulky and have a shorter more robust looking tail. They say that our striped bark scorpions are one of the more venomous scorpions. It has one of the more painful stings. And so many of us have been stung by them, walking barefoot at night, reaching underneath logs, that kind of thing. And you know how painful that sting can, can be. These guys and all scorpions are interesting because they illuminate, they fluoresce under black light. So if you shine a black light on their body, something in their exoskeleton reflects back. So that's a trick to being able to find one if you lose it in your house at night. Super common in homes, especially when you're around places where there's a lot of construction going on, or you live in areas that have a lot of uh, rocky, kind of um, um, not a whole lot of soil, but a lot of rocky landscaping. 
and they are able to climb trees. So it is not common to have them drop off of a tree limb and get into your attic and you find one on a second story when you never saw it on the first story to begin with. They say that the young are worse to sting you than the the adults are and that's just really because the young don't have control over how much venom they can give whereas the adults can so essentially they have less venom than the adults do but they give you all of their venom at one time another species of scorpion that we find in texas and probably only the second species that we find is a much darker species this this image makes it appear as if the legs are lighter but the body can be almost black very black in color and generally those those pinchers are much more robust these are called texas cave scorpions they're found throughout texas especially in areas where you find caves but also, even if you don't have a cave that you know about, a cave that you can get into, we oftentimes have um, limestone outcroppings, these karst features, and they can also be found underneath limestone rocks. So you may not realize that you have an area for a cave scorpion, and you might think that that name is misleading. But in the, in the San Antonio and the Central Texas area, there are actually a lot of habitats that these guys could very easily persist in. Another really interesting, very unique, kind of alien-like looking arachnid are the vinegaroons or the whip scorpions. And they are in the order Europigi. The reason why they get the name vinegaroon or whip scorpion is because when they are disturbed, they will emit acetic acid, which smells like vinegar, which is essentially vinegar. So it smells like vinegar when they're irritated. Um, it kind of sometimes takes a lot to make that happen, but that would definitely make a predator get away from it. They also have a very long, skinny, uh, kind of whip-like whip structure at their very tip. They are not venomous because there is no sting there, but that's where the name whip scorpion comes from. These guys are nocturnal hunters. They feed on insects, scorpions, and other um, terrestrial isopods like pill bugs and sow bugs. And they're found throughout Texas, but they really do do much better in very arid environments. So while you can find them in San Antonio, the west side of San Antonio is more common to have them. And even further west of San Antonio, of the I-35 line, you're gonna find more of these vinegaroons. If you go up into Midland and in Lubbock, they're much more common than they are in Austin and San Antonio, and especially in Houston. But that is not to say that they're not found there and that you cannot find them there. Pseudoscorpions are a very um, interesting and, and very, very tiny group of arachnids. They're almost very cute in their, in their structure. They look kind of like scorpions with the pinchers in the front, but they do not have a venom uh, tail. They are very, very small, five millimeters or smaller. Um, you, can, you almost don't notice them when you see them crawling around. They're almost, they're, they're, they almost look like just a speck of dirt. They have very large pedipalps like the scorpions do. They may or may not have eyes. If they do have eyes, they generally have four eyes. There's about 200 North American species. I don't know how many we have exactly in Texas, but where you would find them is under bark, under stones. You would find them in leaf litter. You might find them between siding or wood siding boards of buildings. Places like that where they're where they are protected um, and where there's very, very tiny insects that they can feed on themselves. They're also interesting because they do have silk glands like, or like the other arachnid spiders do. So they're able to produce silk cocoons to make it through the winter time. And you can see there a variety of the different ways that they look. The only thing that really is the same about every single one of those is that they have those large pedipalps that are modified into pinchers. And they use those pinchers to grab at their prey and eat them. And you can see here how small they are. Large pinchers, big attitude, but very small insects, or I'm sorry, very small arachnids. They are not insects. You could probably pick it up and it wouldn't really do anything to you because it's so small that it can't really pinch you or bite you hard enough. Solifugids are the wind scorpions, camel spiders, also called sun spiders or sun scorpions. They're neither scorpions or spider, so that's why it's all one word instead of two separated words. One thing that's unique about them is that they have very large chelicerae or mouth parts. 
And so if you were to pick one up, they might bite you, but they don't have a venom gland, so it would hurt physically, but there's no venom to actually hurt you. They are considered nocturnal, and they're found under objects or in their own little burrows, and they're more common in arid parts of the state. So just like the vinegaroons, they're found in the western portion of the state, although that is not to say that you would not find that on the Gulf Coast or even in East Texas or North Texas. One thing that is kind of unique about them is that their pedipalps are very long. They're longer actually than the body is. You can see it there in that picture on the top hand side. The pedipalps are about as long as the body and much longer than their legs. And then you notice that the, that the first set of legs are kind of reduced. Well, they use their pedipalps in their first set of legs as feelers and tasters. And so instead they will run on their hind legs. And they get the name wind scorpion because they're very, very incredibly fast runners. They get the name sun scorpion, camel spider, or sand scorpion because they're found in very arid environments and really common in more desert-like countries. And um, a lot of, you may have seen this before on the internet, but a lot of our soldiers, um, when they were in the in Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, where it's very very arid, they were they were coming across these very unique insects or these very unique arachnids, and you may have seen a picture like this where people were claiming that these camel spiders are gigantic. In this image, it's actually a camel spider eating another camel spider or attached to it in some way, um, but it's an optical illusion. They're not actually as large as that guy's leg. It's as small as the ones that we have here. It's just that the person is holding it right in front of the camera with things in the background, makes it appear to be extremely large, but they don't get this large. Again, they have an exoskeleton, and so that keeps them and restricts them from getting too big. The final type of arachnid that we're going to be looking at is in the order of Pileonis. And so these are the harvestmen, or more commonly known as our daddy long legs. You may have heard before that daddy long legs are not spiders, but they are arachnids. They're not spiders because they're not in the order Aranae, which is what the spiders are found in. There are 150 species in North America, but only about 13 species found in Texas. And we generally find these in caves or more cooler places, under rocks, under bark, in very protected environments. You might find them in an outdoor chiminea or an outdoor fireplace would be a common place to find them, under the eaves of your houses, places like that. They by and large are scavengers or they're predators. There is no evidence to suggest the old urban legend that they are the most venomous things that could, if they had a mouth part large enough to bite you, it would kill you. And that's simply not true. Many of them have very reduced mouth parts and they're just feeding on decaying organic matter, you know, fungus, algae, that kind of um, type of material. A lot of times you'll find many, many, many of them climb, climbed and piled up on the side of a concrete structure or on the uh, foundation of the structure or up underneath the eaves of the house. They're finding cooler pockets where they just congregate in huge massive amounts and those long long legs just kind of undulate and if you irritate them you can kind of see the whole thing just kind of vibrating. So they're a very very unique um, arachnid but fairly harmless just kind of frightening because they are so large. So thanks for joining me for this week's weekly webinar. Hope you enjoyed it and learned a little bit more about arachnids. Be, be sure to check out more of our webinars on this channel, My Extension 210. My name is Molly Keck, and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service.